Hi there. So I study the topological structure of ecological interactions. Basically, I look at the mathematical properties of networks that look like this. These are wasps that have a symbiotic relationship with fig trees. What I do is kind of like social network theory, if like every organism on Earth joined Facebook. <laughs> when I started my research, I needed to find some system, some, eco, some group of interacting organisms to study. So I'll admit, this talk isn't exactly, exactly ecology, but rather about how to identify an ecological system that will yield lots of juicy research papers. This is one of the things that happens when you go to graduate school. You end up optimizing the optimizations of the optimizations. So when I started graduate school, I thought it'd be really cool to study hyperthermophilic archaea. These organisms live in near boiling water, live in near boiling water in volcanic vents. So I went to the Kamchatkan Peninsula in Siberia, which you may know from Risk. Um, <laughs> It looks, it looks pretty awesome, right? Um, but the truth is, this photograph was uh, totally staged, actually. Um, here's the reality. Um, I spent my days standing in a lake of boiling water, um, slowly scalding my hands and feet, and moving very, very so slowly and carefully so that I wouldn't just fall in and become soup. Um, and my reward was to spend hours sitting in the mud afterwards getting eaten alive by billions of mosquitoes while I filtered the samples. And remember, this is Russia. So of course, <laughs> a grizzly bear wandered over and just chewed up all the, all the samples on the last day, and so I came home with almost nothing. And this sounds like it's a joke, but this, this actually happened. <laughs> um, so the conclusion, don't, don't do that. <laughs> um, it's really, it's, no, just don't. So I decided to look at ecosystems that are a little closer to home. So I figured, how about halophilic archaea? These guys live in hypersalty lakes, like this one in the southern part of the San Francisco Bay. And um, you know, it seemed like a good idea. Uh, so I went down there, collected at some samples, and um, I discovered there's just one problem. Halophiles make huge quantities of cadaverine and putrescine, two of the most horrible smelling chemicals on Earth. It's basically a giant lake of vomit and death. <laughs> also, it takes longer to drive to the South Bay than Siberia. So, <laughs> so I decided to scrap this idea too. So, I was getting, you know, like, my advisor's like, why haven't you graduated yet? Like, where, like, so, um, so I decided to be a little more careful about choosing my next study system. So it needs to have a couple of requirements here. So it needs to have novel interactions. Uh, it needs to have high biodiversity. And the field work can't be too expensive or difficult or dangerous. And also, I really hate doing paperwork. <laughs> the answer was obvious imaginary ecosystems. <laughs> Scientists call this the ludic ecosystem, from ludos in Latin, meaning to frolic or play. <laughs> so first, I examined my own collection of stuffed animals. This system is characterized by negligible resource inputs, which severely constrains the net biodiversity. However, I really cannot emphasize enough the advantages that this system enjoys over working in pools of pain and misery and death and vomit. <laughs> so, the second ecosystem I examined uh, was a network of stuffed animals belonging to the children of one of our postdoctoral researchers. Um, this network has high diversity and many novel interactions. Most organisms um, have very detailed life histories which the local guides explained to me over the course of roughly 200 million hours. Um, however, while the diversity of this system is high, the low resource inputs severely constrain the net population and biodiversity of these organisms as well. And this makes the statistics a bit dicey. So, I finally just, just, just a few weeks ago, before this talk, I finally received access permits to, to study a ludic ecosystem that ramifies throughout the residence of a university faculty member. 
very high resource availability in this system has led to the gross growth of an exceedingly populous and diverse ludic ecosystem with over a thousand individuals and hundreds of species represented. This photograph actually represents only about 13% of the net biodiversity. <laughs> the local guides are also extremely knowledgeable and were able to identify the precise taxonomic position of more than half of the organisms present here. The rest I was able to fill in with DNA sequencing, which um, don't tell the budget people about that. Um, here are some of the <laughs> organisms that were observed. Um, <laughs> Yes, this is actual data. Wow. <laughs> so, after aligning the marker genes from their DNA and reconstructing their evolutionary history, I built this phylogenetic tree of the organisms in the ludic ecosystem that I had been studying, right? And then, you know, there's one more piece of information that's important to understand when you're actually looking at ecology, and that's the interactions. So I asked them, the local guides, about these interactions and took very careful field notes. Um, and I discovered the dominant interaction in this ecosystem is um, enemies, um, followed by, uh, closely, by friends. Um, and uh, Rather to my surprise, uh, the, the third most common interaction in this ecosystem was married. <laughs> Which you will note in some cases spans from vertebrates all the way to, um, to jellyfish. So, um, so now that I finally had this data to work with, you know, like here I am in like year seven, right? So, uh, the rest is actually quite straightforward. Um, you just build the adjacency matrix of the interacting phylogenies and you, from which you compute the eigenvalues and then um, from there the spectral density distributions. And um, then you, uh, well, of course, different networks, as you, as, as very clear from the mathematics, um, have different spectral densities. And so you can compare how different they are using the Jensen-Shannon divergence, as I've done here, right? <laughs> and here are the results. Um, <laughs> note the axes. Uh, the ludic exo ecosystems, the, 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 the ludic ecosystem is picked out in here with the, the blue points, um, which as you can see are, are quite different from the aludic ecosystems from our database of previously studied systems. Um, and uh, this last bit in green is uh, some control thing that is entirely meaningless, but reviewer three insisted that we put it in there. <laughs> um, so here it is. And as you can see, ludic ecosystems are mostly quite different from, um, from ludic ecosystems, or from aludic ecosystems. And so I wondered to myself, what, what's missing? Um, so what makes these ecosystems so different? Well, the dominant interactions in the ludic ecosystems were, of course, married, friends, and enemies, whereas the ecosystems that we typically study are actually more dominated by predation, of course, we all know predation, and even more importantly, parasitism. Come on, this is cool. I think it's cool, well, anyway. So, so I wondered to myself, well, do you think, it, it, would, these, would the ludic ecosystem be more similar to um, typically studied ecosystems if we added these missing interactions back in? So, so I, I returned to the field site and, and, and did so. Um, and um, here are those interactions picked out in pink. Um, and of course, we're still missing the most important interaction in most ecosystems, which is parasitism. So I also added that. Um, after the crying stopped, um, I added these, uh, here are these interactions and in, picked out in blue. And when you redo the math, right, um, what I discovered is that the ludic ecosystems with these, um, these interactions added back into the, the, um, 
the, the graph and the, the Laplacian matrix and you know, so forth, all the, the rest of the mathematical machinery, which I covered earlier, which is my actual dissertation. Uh, <laughs> uh, not, not joking. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the ludic ecosystems actually look much more similar to the, the previously studied ecosystems. And so what we can conclude from this is that fieldwork is actually a waste of time. Um, <laughs> what you really need to do is just find a ludic ecosystem and complement it with the necessary, um, well, more familiar and more common interactions, right? And you've, you've got your study system. You can just go and do all the math you want, right? It's wonderful. Um, bearing in mind that there may be some resistance <laughs> to this idea. So, um, finally, in conclusion, this discovery came along with some alarming data. Globally, ludic ecosystems are being destroyed at an unprecedented rate. <laughs> and the primary causes of the loss of this habitat are homework, <laughs> chores, and bedtime. This is why I encourage all of you to write to your representatives in Congress and ask them to pass legislation to protect ludic habitats by banning these destructive practices. Thank you. Questions from the judges? Um, I think we all really appreciated both the X and the Y axis. Um, I oh, would have absolutely. also liked a Z axis. Why didn't you include one? Oh, um, well, the, the, it, it probably has something to do with the, the graphics processor on this computer. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the, the, there, there's some software for that, but it's not installed. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's understandable. Um, what about Smurfs? So I had the same question. Um, <laughs> funny you should mention that. No way. <laughs> but this was actually one of the more challenging things that I had to deal with. Um, uh, not Smurfs exactly, but there are these things called Pokemon. Yeah. Um, which I was not able to find any hits in the DNA database for. Um, and um, I, I don't know, they're, they're, that, that's a problem. There's a, it's a missing piece of the data. Uh, maybe future work can, can, uh, can follow us up. So this is obviously a very complex ecosystem, engaging other ecosystems like the Smelly Sibling and others. Uh, so I was wondering, though, how, what can we learn from simpler ecosystems like the collectors of Beanie Babies that can be applied forward to the ludic system? <laughs> oh, uh, I, that's, a perfect, that's a perfect example of a ludic ecosystem. The, the only necessary thing that you would, you would need to study, uh, you know, Beanie Babies or something like that, would be uh, the right PCR primers. <laughs> Have you considered the Tea Party ecosystem? You saw my slides, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the, the, there was in fact a Tea Party involved in the, like, I, I believe that's... I don't oh. know if you can see the... Oh, it's, it's, not, it, it's about around here. There's a Tea Party going on right over here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 right, sorry, it was yeah, yeah. right there. I, so, I, my I bad. should have picked that out earlier. My bad. I think, have you seen my slides is one of the best answers to a question ever <laughs> at Bobfest. <laughs> Another big hand for Russell Neches.